information on things that you need as a beginner bird watcher. So I'll just chuck this together at the tea house. So I think the most important thing is obviously interest, right? Like you have to be interested in what you're doing, otherwise there's not much point. Um, the next most important thing is probably resources. So you need to have reference material when you're starting out. Like it's hopeless just trying to go out and figure things out if you don't have a field guide, for example. So that's probably the next most important thing. And you can actually do a fair bit of birding without having binoculars or a fancy camera or anything. You just need those resources to start with. Binoculars are probably what I would get next when I, when I was starting out. That's the first bit of birding equipment I got after I had some field guides. And then as you go further down the list, a camera becomes helpful. That probably should be below the community aspect of it, but yeah, camera's helpful. And then knowing other people who are into the same stuff with potentially more experience, more knowledge can help you as well. Now, in terms of what field guide to get, this one that's on the screen, the Australian Bird Guide, is the one that I would recommend above all the others. It's the newest, it was released in 2017. It's the most comprehensive. All the maps are up to date, the species list's up to date. The information in it is really, really good. The illustrations are all really, really good. And then as you go down the list of these other ones, they kind of get worse. I mean, they've all got all the birds in them, but there's various, varying degrees of information. The illustrations are of varying degrees of quality, etc. So I've just put the author's names for the other guides. If you want the actual names of the guides, just come up and ask me at the end and I can tell you them. But that's the one that I would recommend. It's currently on sale for about 35 bucks and it's awesome, so I would get that one. If you want to expand your library, the next one to get is probably Pizzy and Knight, which is the latest edition is the ninth edition, I think. It's been around for a long time. The ninth edition has a purple cover with birds on it. It's got purple and birds. Next one that I would recommend would be Slater. That's the smallest guide, so it's only about this big. The illustrations in that are really, really good, and it's you can keep it with you in the field easily, but the information's a bit light on. Then the next one, Simpson and Day. Is the second yes? one that you said, please? It's on the screen. Oh, sorry. It's uh, made by the Slaters, so Peter Slater and his family made that one. I can tell you at the end anyway. Um, and Simpson and Day is kind of, the information is really, really good, but in my opinion, the illustrations aren't amazing. So that's how I'd kind of rank them. Now, one thing that I forgot to put in here is that there are a couple of useful bird apps or, yeah, a couple of useful bird field guide apps. So Pissy and Knight have their entire book in an app form. And it's also got a lot of photographs as well, which you don't get in the book. The book's just illustrations. So all the illustrations, all the info is in the app, plus photos, plus sound recordings. The problem with that is the sound recordings aren't the best ones out there. The best ones out there are in an app called Australian Birds, I think, by Michael Morecambe. I'll just quickly check that. Yeah, it's called Oz Birds. And he's got this sound recordist, Dave Stewart, he's got his whole library and they're the best sound recordings available. So if you want kind of comprehensive coverage on your phone, you probably want to look at those two, Pizzy and Knight and Morecambe's app. If you just search Australian birds in the app store, they'll come up. Now next, I just had a quick look at this at the tea house. So these are the binoculars that I had when I started birding. They're really, really good. So. The ones that I was using on the Walker Swarovskis, they're worth about three and a half grand. The difference in quality between these and the Swarovskis, which are almost 10 times the price, is not noticeable if you're not doing this stuff day in, day out, every day, and going hard. So it's probably not worth that investment unless you get really serious. You can pick these up, I had a look, they're on sale at the moment in Australia, you can get them from cheaper overseas and get them sent over, but in Australia, the cheapest ones I could see this morning were 420 bucks. And they're awesome. They're waterproof, they're nitrogen filled, so the light transmission's really good, they're really tough. I've still got my old pair and I still use them if I'm doing really 
um, rough and tumble kind of field work because I don't want to scratch up my nice pair. But they're very good and very highly recommended. They'll last for ages, um, well worth getting. Now, in terms of camera, this, this is a thing that's become more and more important as the ability to take photos and have good quality photos has become easier and easier over the last 10 years. So probably the best place to start is just like a little point and shoot with a good zoom because you're gonna get identifiable images out of it and you don't need to drop, you know, three or four grand. If you go beyond that level of interest, you wanna start looking at like a DSLR with interchangeable lenses and stuff like that. But, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're interested in this stuff, just come and talk to me at the end and I can give you a little list of what I would recommend. I shoot with Canon gear um, and I think that's probably what most people use these days, but yeah, there's a lot of options. And again, a sliding price range from you know, a few hundred bucks to 10,000, so. Now the last thing would be the community aspect of all this type of stuff. There's a couple of groups called BirdLife Southern Queensland or BirdLife Southern Coast, depending on where you live, that have meetings, they, they take bird walks um, in general, and not being mean, but it's generally older people that go to these things. They're kind of like the hangers on of the, the old school naturalists. And there's a lot of really good knowledge there. Um, they give a monthly talk, you know, they have guests come and talk and things like that. I've done a few of them. Um, and they're quite good groups. They've got a lot of resources. They have a library that you can borrow stuff from. They've got, you know, guides to birding in the local area, etc. cetera. Um, what most people tend to do these days, instead of doing that real life stuff, is look on Facebook, which I am not the greatest fan of, but there's a lot of useful information on there. So there's a page called Australian Bird ID, which is a group where people post photos if they can't figure it out. Um, frustratingly, a lot of people, beginners, seem to be using that as the default rather than looking at the field guide, which I don't think will help you learn very well. But it is useful if you've got something you can't figure out, you can chuck it up there and, and have someone identify it for you or help you identify it. There's also a group for the obsessive, mad people like me called Australian twi Twitches which is where all the rare birds get posted. So if you want to be in the loop for the rarities and the crazy stuff that's, you know, blown in from Siberia or something, that's where you look. And then more locally, there's a group called Southeast Queensland Birders, which is basically like, it started as kind of a twitches for Southeast Queensland, but now it's just um, changed to be basically birding in Southeast Queensland. So that's just a very quick, intro to how I would suggest you get started birding. Um, of course, everyone's got a different path into this weird world, but that's that, hopefully that's some good tips for you. Um, and now we will talk about what we saw this morning. That can not be saved. All right, so does anyone know what that bird is? This is part of the quiz, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Kermadec petrel from sure. Southport. Mm -hmm. So this morning we, we went for a walk, we walked about three Ks, we saw 52 species, well yeah. saw and heard 52 yeah. species in about an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, and we're gonna go through them and have a listen to some of the calls have a look at some photos of some of the species and yeah we'll have a chat about it after if anyone has any questions or whatever we can we can do that at the end so we had three of these ducks which are quite pretty unfortunately this morning the light was horrific because of the clouds we can't see super well but these are the ducks that flew over us making that nice little whistling noise so that's what they look like on the deck they gather around in big groups on, on farm dams and you can see they've got these nice plumes which is why their common name is plumed whistling duck. These are just for display, they don't do anything. The whistling noise, they're actually just making that with their mouth or voice box. I'll see if we've got any recordings of them hooting. Yeah, so this is the kind of whistle that they do. 
And they often do it in flight as well. So that's how I picked him up this morning. I heard him, looked up, and there was three ripping over the top of us. They often call it night as well. So they'll, they'll fly, migrate in the night, and you'll hear them going over your house if you're dialed in. <laughs> um, we saw some black ducks with ducklings on the pond beneath the sewage pond. That's probably the most common duck that you'll see in southeast Queensland. Should be familiar to most of you. But one thing that you might not have seen before is this, what's called a speculum. And it's this beautiful metallic green panel in the wing that they use for display. And depending on which angle you see it from, we'll see if there's any more photos of it. Depending on what angle you get it, it'll show different colours. So sometimes it'll be this nice green. They've got no photo. You can kind of see it in this one. It's here, hiding in the wing feathers. So, oh, you can't really see because it's a projector, but it's like this beautiful metallic purple. And depend when the light changes, it'll go from purple to green. It's really pretty. These guys just sound like a duck quacking. <laughs> it's not that interesting. This is some kind of display. We'll try this one. There you go. Quack, 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 quack. Pretty um, standard issue for ducks. Right, so um, this is going through the birds that we saw this morning in taxonomic order. So from the most primitive, so-called primitive, to the most derived or the most highly evolved, although both of those terms are kind of misnomers, really. I mean, some species will have evolved more recently. That doesn't mean they're any more successful or advanced than other older species. So this idea of things being primitive and derived is kind of old, but that's the terminology. Now, we got lucky this morning. We saw some of these little critters. <laughs> They burst out of the grass next to us and zoomed away. But we, we got to see two of them, which was nice. So this is brown quail. And they're probably the most common quail you'll see in southeast Queensland. They're often in long grass. And if you get them up close, they've got this really beautiful vermiculation in their plumage. Really pretty. And they're about this big. You'll often hear the clatter of their wings as they come up and they, they fly away. And, and that's what we heard this morning. But they've got a really distinctive song as well, this kind of two-part whistle. So at dusk, if you're near the grass, you'll often hear this, or in the early morning. Excuse me, are they, are, yep. is that the same species as in, in the Cape York area? Yep, so brown quail will be all up the east coast, mm -hmm. through, through to Melbourne and inland as well. They're pretty common. Um, should have their distribution here. There you go. So pretty much everywhere. Um, yeah. There are a lot of other quail species. I was talking this morning about some button quail as well. Um, but, and there's king quail as well, which is another true quail, like brown quail. They're all much smaller. So king quail is about the size of my fist. The button quail are a bit smaller than that. Um, and they're much more secretive than brown quail. They don't tend to call as much or appear as much unless you scare them out of the grass. Now next we had, um, just I might skip some of these as we go through, just so we stay on time today. But next we had these little guys. These are the little diving things on the dam. This is Australian grebe or Australasian grebe. And like I was saying this morning, they build a floating nest so they, they basically pull the trigger after rain. They go, right, let's have a go. They'll build this little nest out of vegetation. It floats on the surface of the water. And then they'll lay their eggs in that. The eggs will hatch. And hopefully they've got a photo here of the chick. So that's when they're not breeding. And this is breeding plumage. But it's mega cute. The young ones climb onto the back of the adult and just sit on the adult's back and get carried around until they can swim for themselves. <laughs> so there's a little tiny baby. <laughs> Maybe they'll have a photo with one on the back. No. So what what will happen is this little one can't swim very well. So if a predator appears or something, 
It'll just climb up onto the back of the mum or dad and just sit under the wings. Sometimes you see their little heads poking out. It's super cute. These guys have a pretty distinctive call, but with, with a lot of these, like you're not going to hear them very often. So it's like this kind of slidey, rattly, metallic thing that they do when they're breeding. All right, now we're into some of the doves. So we heard a lot of bar shoulder doves and we heard one brown cuckoo dove. Bar shoulder dove is probably the most common thing you'll hear while you're up here. This is the other one. So this is a cuckoo dove. And you can see this nice long tail, which is probably why they got their name. Most of the cuckoos have long tails as well. And these guys are really important for dispersing the seeds of rainforest trees and, and other um, trees, like this tobacco tree. And you'll see them around the site. They're getting around, they're eating all the fruits of the cheese trees and the native tobacco and stuff like that. Outside we've got a common coel, or Pacific coel is the new name. So this is what the cuckoo dove sounds like, just a constant kind of... And then the other species, bar shoulder dove, probably a bit more common on the site. They've got a slightly different call. So it's either this two, three part thing, or four part like this and they're quite pretty if you see them up close but there's heaps of them so people like me tend to overlook stuff like this because you see them all the time and they're not that interesting but when you take a step back and, and have a look they're actually quite pretty and there's heaps of them around do yep. they pair for life? Because I've got the brown cuckoo and they, the pair seems to come back every year. Well, I'm not sure about that. There are some species that do have monogam monogamous yeah. kind of approaches to their life, but I don't know about the, the pigeons. Usually that's for really long-lived stuff. So things like albatrosses or um, swans as well, they tend to, they tend to mate for life. So the two that come back to my kitchen window every year... They, I mean, they could be the same birds. They, they could be a couple, I just don't know. I mean, you can't really... Unless they're banded or something, you can't really tell the difference between individuals unless there's something weird going on with their plumage. So, tough to say. You could try and catch one and paint his nails or something. <laughs> and see. <laughs> Now, we heard these guys, we didn't see them, but I'm sure you would have seen these before. This is a pheasant cuckoo. So it's the first one of the cuckoos that we're going to go through in a sec. But these don't actually parasitize other birds. So they're kind of weird in the, in the cuckoo family because they make their own nest, they take care of their own young. Usually you'll see these, that's a female. You'll see these... Um, on top of stuff and they do this nice call i'll play the call in a sec they'll perch up out of the grass and do this nice call and then they'll scurry back down most often you'll see them running across the road in kind of a suicidal dash in front of your car which is a bit sad a lot of them get killed on the roads so has anyone heard that before yeah. Really nice, I love it. So this guy's probably perched up out of the grass and he's doing this song to de defend his territory. Or to advertise to the cheeky babes and say, hey, I'm here, I have a nice territory. Now, this coel is what was calling before, so I'm not gonna play the call because I don't wanna freak him out. But I might give it a quick blast actually, because he's not calling at the moment, but this is a male. This is what the female looks like, so totally different. Um, oh, he started up again now. Will they fly in here? He may fly in and you'll have to wrangle him. He'll fly in and attack the speaker. So that's him calling outside, helpfully. Yeah. <laughs> 
Now, so the, these are cuckoos as well, and these, these are probably going to target things like fry birds or blue-faced honey eaters, like the kind of medium-sized honey eater type things. Um, and they actually migrate every year from Papua New Guinea. So they come down from Papua, in the breeding season, they target the other birds, they get their chicks, and then they all go back to New Guinea uh, to avoid the winter. So they're traveling to um, stay in their preferred temperature and also to take advantage of these silly things that raise their young for them. That's where the storms come from. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's one of the common names is Stormbird and it's probably because of the association between the summer when they're here and the thunderstorms, which we might actually get this year but has been a bit light on for the last few years. So, so if they grow up with other species, how do they know to go to Papua New Guinea? I think that's pretty unknown really. I mean there's, there's some species like these guys, channel build cuckoo, they actually come back to the nest they, so they parasitise crows and currawongs and bigger things because they're pretty big, they're about that big. Um, they actually come back and get their chick and then take the chick with them back, back to Papua. But things like coels don't. And things like shorebirds, you know, which make monstrous migrations from Siberia to Tassie, the chick will grow up, it'll get its flight feathers, it'll feed for a couple of months and it'll go, right, let's go, bang, and go to Tasmania probably to one of the same beaches that its parents went to. So they have no prior knowledge of that on their first migration. So there has to be some kind of genetic component to it or genetic memory, if you, if you want to call it that. Um, they use a lot of different things to navigate during migration. So there's been some studies that show that birds and other migratory things as well have these lines of cells in their brains that are actually magnetised, so they can kind of follow compass bearings. But really weird stuff goes on with migration, particularly shorebirds. So <coughs> in Broome, they've shown, excuse me, <coughs> they've shown that some species will delay their typical leaving date by up to two weeks. And they're going like, what's going on? Why aren't they leaving? They're going to be late to the breeding grounds. And then as they're on migration, a cyclone develops and they get the tail end of the cyclone and get this boost from the cyclone. Wow. So they can like forecast weather, you know, weeks ahead somehow, we don't know how. But there's all these migrations, nuts, like it's crazy stuff, so pretty cool. Um, but yeah, with the coel, I don't know if it's nature or nurture, uh, how they know to get back to Papua, but that's what they do. Same with these. We saw some of these getting around this morning. I'm sure you've seen some too and heard them. This is the channel build cuckoo. So the biggest cuckoo that we get in Australia. Like I said, they target larger birds like crows and currawongs. And they, they get the name because they've got this nice groove in their giant honking bill. And these guys eat fruit, so you'll potentially see some um, in the fig trees, lots of the fig trees on the side of fruiting at the moment. And I'm sure everyone's familiar with this beast, but I'll just blast it because I like it. Yes. So, they do these kind of crazy dinosaur squawks. And often one, one will fly around squawking and distracting the, the host. And then the other one in the pair will go to the nest, the female, and, and lay her eggs. While the crows are chasing around the noisy one. Super cool. Um, how many? How many eggs? Will they lay all their eggs in one in one nest? I don't actually know. That's a good question. So I think they only lay one. Mm -hmm. um, other species of cuckoo lay more than one. But often what will happen is the first cuckoo to hatch, they're pretty aggressive as nestlings. If there's any other eggs in the nest, once one hatches, he'll just push them out, and he'll do it same with the host's eggs as well. Yeah. So. It's kind of first in best dressed with them. Um, Pretty ruthless. Yeah, but it's a way to make sure that at least one chick gets through, I suppose. <laughs> we heard a lot of these, but we didn't see any this morning. They're usually in pretty thick veg, so not surprising. They're a brush cuckoo. So there's a few around the site. There's at least, I don't know, I think this morning we had three or four, but there's heaps. 
and they'll be singing all day, sometimes singing in the night. And these target things like the Lewin's honey eater, for example. They'll, they'll try and get in there and lay their eggs in Lewin's honey eater nest. Well, this is from Malaysia, different subspecies, so we'll listen to our one. So they do this kind of slowly descending series of whistles, but they also do, this might have it, this crazy, if not, I'll, I'll imitate it. Yes, yeah, so that's kind of like it. They, they get, when the males are all together in a bunch, they get into this kind of calling frenzy where they, you know, and it gets higher and higher and higher as each male like competes with each other and it starts doing this crazy trilling and they all fly around and get into a big bunch and fight. Can I ask you, on the graph there, is mm -hmm. what, the, what you see above and above, is that like two, an octave and then another octave? So they're, they're harmonics. Yeah, so this is a sonogram, right? And that's just harmonic resonance. So this is the, the dark part is the main body of the call and these are repeated, yeah, high frequencies. Like 4K, 8K and... So, yeah, this is... 4,000 kilohertz, the first harmonics at what, six, seven? And then maybe like nine? Yeah. I used a lot of these in my PhD because um, when everything's calling together and overlapping, you can still pick out distinctive things. So things like Lewin's Honey Eater, when we, when we look at that a bit later, you can see it's always really distinctive. They're handy to use. And we might skip the Moorhen, that's pretty boring. They're around in all fresh water everywhere but we will have a look at this because we only heard this thing this morning and it's quite a cool species pretty secretive um, and there's one calling down near Lake Gula at the moment we heard it this morning so if you get up in the early morning and you hear the beast it might be worth trying to imitate the call it might come out and have a quick look so it's a pale vented bush hen Related to things like moor hens, but super secretive in comparison. Like they're not swimming around, they're just skulking in the veg usually. Quite a pretty bird. If you, if you get close to it and you can see the bill close up, it's like this nice pale pastel green. And I'll play the call, because that's probably how you're going to get onto it, if you do. Or the song, I should say. So th this is one like advertising in its territory. What we heard this morning was more like this. So they, they start whistling, they go... Like this, and it just continues. They just keep doing it at the same... Once they've started that and got up to their level that they like, they just keep going with that. Super cool little bird. Um, there's the distribution, so they occur in Papua as well and all up the east coast, but more often heard than seen. Now, little black cormorant, we saw that flying over, that's pretty boring, I'll skip that. Laughing kookaburra, I'm sure everyone knows what that looks like and sounds like, so we'll skip that one. And now, this is an interesting one that we didn't get the other morning I was up. So, sacred kingfisher, super cute. Really distinctive call. And interesting because they choose to nest in termite mounds. So they burrow into the termite mound. The termites will go, what's going on? They'll seal up the little chamber that the kingfisher has dug. They'll just seal it off. So there's this perfect little chamber inside the mound, sealed up, and the termites maintain the temperature of their mound. So it helps with incubation as well. And also keeping the, the nestlings safe because not many- Do they get enough oxygen? Yeah, I mean, the, the entrance hole's about that big, the tunnel's probably that long, and then the chamber's like this big, so just easy to get in and out. The parents come in and out, feeding them all the time. And, yeah. This is a younger one. So these are interesting. They move up and down the east coast as well. So at this time of year in the breeding season, like late spring, early summer, they're setting up their territories, they're calling all the time. But in winter, they don't like how cold it gets here, so they go north like a lot of these things tend to do. And this call is probably familiar. Most of the kingfishers have this kind of repeated thing going on. And we heard one this morning just down near the creek down there. So if you cruise down there, you'll probably find the mound if you're interested where they're nesting. 
Sorry? This? I'm doing repeat things. Oh, yeah, it's a noisy miner. Oh, no. Pest. No. Mm. They're, not, they're not pests. They're native species, but they're really aggressive. Yeah. And they get into big, mm. annoying family groups and exclude all the nice little birds. Ooh. They're bullies, yeah. Mm. Despotic species <laughs> is the technical term. Um, now, we saw these from a distance across the uh, sewage pond, but we only saw young ones. So this is an adult. I don't know how good the projector is. You're not really getting the full experience of the rainbow beater, but very pretty if you see them up close. They, you can see a bit better there. So they've got this beautiful, like, pastel, soft, bright greens and blues and yellows. Really pretty. And they're an aerial species, so they're feeding on aerial insects all the time. <coughs> and these guys nest in earthen banks. So sandy banks, sand dunes, the edges of stuff like that. They'll be nesting there. Interestingly, the young ones up near the pond look, you know, prob they probably fledged within the last couple of weeks. So there might be a big pile of dirt or something up there that they've, they've nested in. And again, they're a migratory thing, so they're moving up and down the coast as well. Rainbow lorikeet, everyone knows that, I'm sure. Scaly-breasted lorikeet, yeah. Let's skip them, boring. Variegated fairy wren, very cool. Probably one of the prettiest birds you'll see in southeast Queensland, in my opinion. So that's a male in full breeding plumage. They have this crazy electric blue head, um, this like, dark lilac patch and then this nice chestnut thing um, but if you see that in good light with the sun behind you with your binoculars the blue on the face in particular is just insane like, you'll be struck down <laughs> <laughs> and this is what a female looks like so super different and the, the female fairy wrens are quite difficult to tell apart so the way you tell the variegated fairy wren is this like dark mask so she's pretty grey in comparison to the other one that will be here. And she has this dark, almost, um, it's reddish in real life, but it's very dark red, like dried blood kind of colour. And it goes in front of the eye and joins the bill. That part of the face is called the laws, if you want to get technical. So here's a, here's a male from behind, you can see the, the electric blue. Super cool. And another female. So we had two species this morning. Their call's pretty much impossible to tell apart, so I'll just play red-backed. So this is the other one we had this morning. We saw one male and his little harem of females hanging out with him. And that's what the red-backed female looks like. So she's kind of browner in comparison to the variegated. And you can see she's got a plain face. She doesn't have any marking on the face. The problem is young males of both species also look quite similar to this. And males, when they're not in breeding plumage, also look similar to this. So I advise that you get stuck into the Australian Bird Guide and learn all the different plumages. <laughs> oh, I'll play the call, sorry. I'm sure most people have heard this, but... Super complex call, lots of harmonics. I um, saw a talk at a conference once where the guy was really getting stuck into analysing the sonograms of these species. And he was saying that redback fairy wren in particular has one of the most complex songs of any species in the world. If you look at the sonogram and the amount of harmonics and the alteration in frequency, it's just full on. And if you slow it down, what sounds to us like this kind of constant sliding changing thing is actually like a, s a whole series of like sub songs within that sequence really cool but most of them i mean most of them sound the same their contact calls are slightly different and the song is slightly different but it needs a lot of practice you're probably not going to pick it up and so do they practice a lot when they're young to get that good well I'm, I'm not sure about when they're young i mean when they when they come into breeding age for a couple of years, they hang out with their parents. So they're one of the species that have so-called helpers at the nest. So 
there's a few theories as to why that occurs. One is that they learn how to provision for the young. So they help their mum and dad raise the next generation. They kind of get practice at raising kids. Another theory is that it's beneficial for them because they get um, experience at foraging and stuff while they're still kind of under the protective umbrella of the big group before they go and start their own territory. And then the last theory is that they inherit their parents' territory when they die. So they'll just wait until, you know, the dad dies and then they'll get that territory. But there's a, there's a few species that do that. It's semi-common in Australian birds um, and potentially some of the females that we saw with the male this morning could have been younger males or females helpers at the nest from previous generations. Um, another cool paper, sorry not to get too distracted, but another cool paper that I read last year was on fairy wrens recognising their parents' individual calls as brand new fledglings. Like literally they've come out of the egg and in an experimental setting they'll play different songs to them from different pairs and they'll only open their mouth to their own parents. So they can learn the call of their parents inside the egg before they've even hatched. It's just totally crazy. Is it a repetitive call rather than an individual sort of communication? What, what do you mean, sorry? In what? the sense that it's a complex call but it's on repetition. Yeah, so a, a, an individual male will have his own repertoire and his own song sequence. So, that's so they're a, not talking to each other? So. Well, they are, they're communicating, so that's like territorial display, yeah. um, defence, advertising, and other species, uh, other members of the species will recognise that, but the chicks in particular will recognise their individual parents. Probably other birds can recognise individuals as well, but I just I thought that was cool that they can learn as, you know, things just living in the amniotic fluid. It's just nuts. Um, how many female birds call? What do you mean? So like, uh, I know a lot of um, males have territorial calls. Yep. Do females also? F females call as well. So I'm, I'm being a bit blase with my terminology here. So there's song yeah. and call. Um, and most birds, the males will be the ones that sing. Females sing in some species and a lot of them also do this stuff called subsong, which is very quiet and generally to each other, like to a, a pair when they're preening each other or something, they're just like warbling away to each other. Um, but all birds have the ability to call. Some birds don't have the ability to sing. So these earlier ones that we went through in the list, before we got to the so-called songbirds, they can't sing. So things like um, the doves, for example, like I think the cutoff is yeah, the columba forms, the pigeons and stuff. Everything above that in the or below that in the evolutionary hierarchy doesn't have a voice box. I can't remember the technical term for the bird one, but it's a bit different than uh, mammals ones because it can produce sound coming in and going out at the same volume and stuff. So they can that's how they can keep up this constant thing. Uh, but sorry, getting carried away. The, the simple answer is males in general sing, but females can call as well. And often they'll have fairly distinctive calls as well. Uh, moving on, so this is Lewin's honey eater, probably the most common honey eater on site at the moment, I would say. Um, they're a generalist species, so they eat a lot of different things, insects, fruit. Um, sometimes they'll take some nectar and they're pretty easy to identify because in southeast Queensland they're the only one that has this big ear patch, this half moon shape behind the ear, about that long from bill to tail. And also a super easy call to remember, just like a machine gun or some kind of rattle. So you'll be hearing that every day I'm sure while you're here. <laughs> Different subspecies have slightly different variations of this call. So sometimes in um, late summer, you'll get some of the North Queensland ones down, which have a slightly faster repetition of that, but they all sound the same machine gun kind of thing. Uh, noisy minor, everyone knows, I'm sure. Noisy fryer bird, most people will know. I'm 
pretty sure they've got this. Uh, I was traumatized by these when I was young because I had to go stay at my grandma's house, who I didn't like very much. And these would be singing outside in the morning every morning. So I've still got this kind of like horrible association with these things. And they look pretty gross too. <laughs> Look so, like a vulture. Yeah, they're called Freiburg because they've got this bald head, um, which is just skin. There's no feathers on the top of the head at all. It's just skin, bare skin. And with vultures, they've probably evolved this because they get covered in gore, right? They can't preen it out of their head, so it's better to just have bare skin and let it dry and crack off. These guys get covered in nectar and pollen, so that, that might be another reason why they've got a bald head. Or some weird sexual selection thing has just driven this. Um, but yeah, they look kind of gross in my opinion. They've got this kind of raucous song. We heard one this morning. And again, um, well, this is from New South Wales too. <laughs> this kind of chortling, cheerful sounding thing. There's a smaller species too called Little Firebird, which is probably on site. I we didn't see any this morning now. And that's also got a fairly bald head, but some feathers on the top, and they've got blue, bright blue, like sky blue skin around their face. Mm -hmm. So you might see one of them while you're up as well. That's their distribution. Noisy Firebird? We shall see what the eBird data shows. Oh. East Coast. Mm -hmm. Are they young? A grey colour as you go north? There are other species of fry bird in North Queensland. Yeah, there's yes. two. There's silver crowned and helmeted. So and they're slightly different. The main difference is the shape of the knob thing on the bill. So helmeted has a monster one, it's like really long and quite tall. And silver crowned actually has some feathers on top of the head, so yeah, they're a bit different in general though, just grey same kind of looking thing, same size. Now this was nice this morning. This is the first time I've seen these here this year. These are the tiny little guys we had down in the creek line around Thornbill. So they're some of the smallest Australian birds. They can be quite difficult to identify because you, they're often in this like dark kind of environment. You don't get a great look. But the best way to tell is this rusty kind of cap which you can kind of see there. They've got kind of a rusty forehead and crown and this strong streaking on the breast as well. The call's really pretty and they do heaps of mimicry but always though in as part of their call they'll have this this kind of like whistling or rolling descending sound. So that's from Tassie. They sound a bit different to the mainland ones. We'll see if we can get one from the mainland. This might be a bit different. And so that's an alarm call when a predator's nearby. And this, remember in the walk I was doing this pitching, where I was like, it's kind of what you're imitating, this type of thing, where there's a predator or something, the little birds will come in and have a look. There's no great example of the little trill, but we heard it this morning. So it's just like a little bubbling, like that faster though, I can't do it with my tongue. <laughs> now this was the pretty songster that we that we heard at the fig tree and then later up the yeah. hill and this is what they look like. They're quite hard to see because they're about the size of a you know a gum leaf, they're like this big. Bright yellow with a white throat. This is white throated gerigony. And that's one of the species you want to learn to pronounce so you don't seem like a duffer when you go to your first bird meeting. <laughs> People say Jerry Gone and Jerry Gone and all these weird things, but Jerigony is the correct, correct pronunciation. <laughs> um, super pretty and a super pretty song as well, which I'll just play quickly. I played it at the start when we're doing the sound check thing. So they're kind of like a dry rainforest, um, eucalypt forest bird. 
they'll often be on the margins of, of the different habitats, so the place called the ecotone between different habitats, that's where they like to hang out. And they join into these mixed species flocks as well. All right, now we'll skip the croupie shark because most people have probably seen that. We'll have a bit of a closer look at cicada bird because we got brief views of them this morning in the bunya pine, but this is a male. So this really nice steely gray plumage with these black accents around his face and on his wings and looking totally different is the female. This is one of the species that gets mixed up for other stuff a lot, a lot, because they look a lot like females of a lot of other things. So Rufus Whistler, um, Very Triller, some of the other female cuckoo shrikes, they look very similar to a lot of those things and they get mixed up all the time. These have a super cool call, in my opinion. I'm sure you've heard it on the site, maybe without realising that it's actually a bird because they sound kind of like a cicada. And they'll do that all day. It's a good way to get onto them because we, we got lucky this morning, super lucky, because they were down low. They're usually right up high on the top of the canopy. Now, whip bird we heard this morning. So we heard multiple pairs singing to each other. This is what they look like. They tend to be really skulky, so they hide in the vegetation and, and they don't show themselves very often. But this is what they look like if you can pin one down. That's a young one that hasn't grown his proper plumage yet. I'm sure everyone knows the call. I'll give it a quick blast. So the whip crack. That's a male, and then this should be a male and a female. So that the two notes on the end are the female replying to the male and saying, yes, I'm still in your territory, I haven't legged it yet. <laughs> and sometimes the, the young males will pretend that they have a female, they'll mimic the, the female and say, yeah, I've actually got a girl in my territory, but they don't. <laughs> They're just showing off. All right, now, I might skip these things. These, these are pretty common things in, in the bush. Most people have probably seen them before. And we'll get down... What should we look at next? Does, it, does anyone have anything that they want to look at from these? Because they're all pretty common things that most people will have seen. Anyone yeah, want to look at... My eyes can't really read those. Oh, it's, so it's going through like the small yeah. bush stuff, so like grey shrike thrush, golden yeah. rufus whistler, olive backed oriole, fig bird, butcher bird, magpie, caramel, like yeah. all yeah. common stuff. Um, yeah. spangled bronco. You'd like to see that? Yes, very beautiful. So we saw a, a small flock of these potentially starting to head south, so they're another migratory thing, they go up and down the east coast. Um, all black, about this big, and they've got this fish tail. They're the only thing that has that fish tail. And the, it's difficult to see here, but you can kind of see around the neck and stuff there. The reason they're called spangled drongo is they have these spangling, mm, mm. kind of like electric blue reflecting feathers amongst their black plumage. So you won't see that unless you get a good look, but they're really beautiful if you can get close. They do a heap of mimicry and they've got this really scratchy, metallic kind of call. These are all from overseas. I'll try this one. So you'll hear them most um, in spring and summer. Now, this is a cool thing that we heard. Unfortunately, we couldn't see it. It was out in the paddocks. <laughs> it's called Restless Flycatcher. And it's probably the biggest one of the Miagras, so it's about that big. And the, they have this crazy black and white plumage, basically. There's not much else that looks like them. They're mm -hmm. difficult to confuse. Mm -hmm. And this crest is erectile, so they can lift it up and put it down. They usually lift it up in, in display. And... 
don't know if they'll have a photo, but the inside of the mouth is orange, which they also show off in display. No, they don't have a photo. These guys have a super cool call. One of the old common names is scissors grinder. Let's see if it, there should be a grinding kind of thing in here. This is the song. We'll see if this is the grinding. Yeah. So they do this, and often they'll do this while they're hovering around like um, grass or low vegetation. And the thought is that they're doing this kind of weird noise to try and scare insects. So things like um, grasshoppers can actually hear pretty well. They obviously make sound and communicate with each other. But they hear this weird thing, they're like, what is this thing? They come out and then they get nailed by the flycatcher. <laughs> pretty cool. And they have this, I wonder if it has it, they've got this contact call that sounds like a frog as well, like this <laughs> Kind of here, there, but not, not well. Most of my acres have this same frog <coughs> contact. What other birds are in the Niagara? All the flycatchers. Oh, okay. So, like leaden flycatcher, satin flycatcher, there's paper bark, uh, broad build, and that's it. And are they kind of distinct? Like, you could tell that it's a flycatcher if you looked at one of them. Or yep. are they all very different? No, they, they all look similar. They've all got the same kind of body shape. Oh, and shining flycatchers and all. They've all got the same kind of body shape. Most of them have this erectile crest. They're often contrasting. So that that's probably the most extreme. Um, but they're often grey on the back and white beneath. The female has like an orange bib. Um, I'll show you some photos after oh. if you want. Yeah. And shining flycatch is crazy. It's entirely, the male is entirely glossy black, like shiny blue and black, crazy looking thing. <laughs> and the female of that's weird because she's like chestnut on the back with a black head. Doesn't look like any of the other ones, but mm. they all have the same um, shape. Mm. One of the weird birding terms that you might hear if you go to a meeting is jizz which is general impression of size and shape. Uh, I think they're a bit, um, you know, they don't know the other meaning of the word, so people will, people will say that quite often um, and get quite strange looks, like, oh, you know, the thing had a really distinctive jeers. They're like, what are you talking about? Private life on birds. <laughs> uh, it, it's a slang term for sperm. Is okay. another meaning of it. So, yeah, maybe more common amongst the youth, I guess. I guess. But yeah, can lead to some awkward looks at times. Now we heard this guy. You probably see him if you're walking along the, the butterfly walk or those kind of closed-in, denser areas. The eastern yellow robin is super pretty. You've got this bright yellow breast, and they have, they have this cute habit of perching sideways on trees. So they'll perch sideways and kind of look at you like this. And they've got a distinctive song and play it. And the calls, that's probably fairly familiar to most people. They just do this for a long time, always the same frequency. And they'll often do that while they're perching sideways too. Pretty cute, they're about that big. Um, heard golden headed cysticola but didn't see it. it. Sounds like some kind of exotic disease. <laughs> um, and th this is another thing, that, like the grass bird that lives in the grass, and they'll they'll come up and sing, and then they'll drop down. They're quite difficult to see. They've got this nice little um, speckly plumage, very small, they're only about that big. And they've got this distinctive. That's from Taiwan, that's not super helpful, probably. They've got this squeaking and clicking kind of thing. Click. Look at the harmonics in that, it's crazy. Beautiful. So that's what I heard this morning, the, the click. 
Yeah. And that they'll be in the long, thick grass, along with this beast, which we, we actually got to see this morning, which is cool. It came out and perched on the boot pine, or the bunya pine, can't remember. But they're pretty secretive. They'll be skulking around in the grass. Unless, as we also saw, they're doing their display flight. So they'll, the male will emerge and do this fluttering flight where he's travelling quite slowly above the grass and then he'll dive back down into the grass and disappear. What does tawny mean? Uh, like rufous kind of yellowy, browny, orangey colour. So this, this descending, the long descending thing is what he's doing when he's in flight, coming down into the grass. Let's see if it has another sequence. So he's jumped up out, he's flying down, 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 and then he lands and does this clicking stuff. <laughs> Pretty nice. Mm. And one that you don't generally see outside of the breeding season, they're pretty secretive. We saw a couple of swallows and martins, they're the aerial little uh, insectivores. Saw one sil or two silver eyes, we saw one and heard one. These are really pretty, and this is a species with heaps of subspecies. Mm -hmm. So there's different subspecies all up and down the east coast. On some of the coral reef islands, there's distinct subspecies. The ones in Tassie look totally different and they're bigger. Potentially, they could be a different species, but maybe they're only on their way to diverging now because they still. The ones from Tassie will come up to southeast Queensland in winter and they still have this huge overlap, so there's probably still genetic transmission. <laughs> so you can see here, oh, that's a, one in New Zealand, that's not too helpful. This is from New Cal. So this is all the same species, but obviously very different subspecies. <laughs> and this is the one that we've got in southeast Queensland for most of the year. See if they've got a Tassie one, just in case you ever see one. No. The Tassie one, this chestnut is much more pronounced and it's quite a lot um, darker and more obvious in the Tassie subspecies. If there's a lot of that sort of subspecies, does that mean they're relatively recently evolved? So well, they spread really quickly, they haven't isolated it long enough to be all become different species? Probably, yeah. So they're on their way, I would say, most of them. Like the ones offshore definitely are on their way to being a new species because they're totally isolated, like they're not, there's no gene flow, but it's probably fairly recently, like since the last ice age, I guess, the Miocene about 10,000 years ago. Those coral reef islands are probably connected to the mainland and there'd be gene flow between them. And now since the seas have come back up, they've got stuck. But evolution takes a long time, you know, if there's another ice age in the next 5,000 years or something, they might just come back and everything will merge together again. There's some super cool um, evolutionary thing that happens w when things come back and forth like that. You get these things called ring species, where you know if you look on two ends of the ring, like around the hemisphere, the things look totally different, but the steps in between are all obvious integrades, like the whole way around, but the two on the end that have been isolated for the longest are just totally different. Yeah. Pretty cool. Speaking about genetics, though, I've listened to ABC Radio a few months ago. There have been new species of bird in Cape York. Um, I wonder what that would be. Yeah, I can't remember if it was a There's been a recent split in the catbirds on Cape York. So there's black-headed catbird now, which used to just be spotted. They've been split. I don't know of any ibis thing recently. Yeah. There's, there's splits going on all the time. Like, as genetics becomes cheaper and easier to do, we're finding more and more species kind of hiding within other species. They're called cryptic species. So they look similar, but potentially, like with the cicada birds, for example, I think you were here last time I was talking about the one in Cape York, yeah. the call's totally different. Yeah. They look the same, but the call's totally different, the distribution's different, that could be a species hiding within common cicada bird. Um, yeah. 
the, the really crazy stuff with genetics is happen, happening with herps, so frogs and, and reptiles. It's just nuts. Like, I think the old, the old reptile field guide had about 600 species. It's up to like 1,300 now. Wow. Stuff's just getting, you know, split and split and split as they look at the genetics. It's full on. Really? Yes. Only the, the gap in Brisbane. And yes. I seem to be getting a bigger variety of birds now than I have had in the past. Yep. Is there evidence that more and more birds are coming in because of their loss of habitat? It birds? could be because of the fires. So it could be from the bushfires last year. So a lot of stuff got smoked, just destroyed. Um, the habitat also, until this recent rain, everything was just crispy, dry, and conditions were horrible. So things might be coming down into the suburbs where people are watering and stuff like that, just because they, they need to to survive. Um, I don't think there's any long-term kind of trend where the suburbs are becoming more diverse. It's probably just due to local conditions, I would say. All right, we might um, just have a quick look at double barred finch and then we'll wrap up. We looked at those other things last time. So this is the one we saw flying ahead of us on the road. The one with the sad little kind of mournful call. <laughs> Super pretty. And if you, if you take it easy and you sneak up on them, they'll usually let you get quite close. And they've got really, really pretty plumage. It's really nice. We'll just listen. Hopefully they've got some sad sounding. <laughs> Yeah. They always sound a bit sad to me. Mm. But yeah, thanks for coming. Um, okay. Thanks for coming to the walk and enjoying the talk also. And I'll just give a quick shout out to Sandra oh, for having me here. Oh, thank you for uh, coming. And Wood Claudia. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and just quickly, this app that I was using in the walk and this website that I've been using with has all this information is called eBird. That's run by the Cornell Lab um, from New York and super handy resource. You can do these things where you look at distribution maps, you can look at frequency of occurrence, all this stuff. Um, is there an Australian equivalent? Well, it's a worldwide, right? It's, it's worldwide, worldwide, yeah. yeah. So, the list that you'll send us? Yep, this is the list that I'll send. So this is what we did this morning. In that site? Yeah. Yep, right. so you'll be able to see it. If you click on this, which is the Wood Fortia hotspot, you'll see all the birds that Roy and I have recorded and cool. others have recorded since 2014, I think, is the last stuff that we've put in. Let's have a look. Yeah, 2014 is the first stuff that Roy's put in. Like, he's been coming here since it started, but... He's only been e-birding since then. So this is like, this is a really useful resource if you've just started birding as well. Like you can go, okay, I'm going to wood food. What have other people seen there? What can I expect? And then you can look at the whole list. You can click on the species and see photos or listen to the songs. Um, and then if you go to your, if you make an account, you can go to your own section where you can see you know what you've seen in this spot or in Queensland or whatever pretty cool uh, and you can keep all your photos and your sound recordings and everything here which is very helpful yeah so, so when, when you use this mm -hmm. and say I find a bird at home and I want to start my own list yep. do I try to identify it first through another means or does this because this doesn't identify hey? this, this one identifies okay so you've got to use you. like a guide or something yeah. identify it and then yeah. put it into your list yeah cool um so i'll just quickly show you how you would start a checklist so you can do it two ways you can get the app and do it on your on your phone which will it'll choose if you're in a place with decent coverage and decent um birding activity, it will choose the species that are most likely to be found there and present them to you. So you have like a kind of smaller list than the Queensland one or whatever. Mm -hmm. We'll put in the Coel from before. Let's see. And so you can do that on your phone with the eBird app, or you can do it online like this. 
what is the date? The 30th. Mm -hmm. And then you just say incidental because I was giving a talk at 10 o'clock. We heard the Coel and we had 20 people or whatever. Cool. And then you say, here we go. And you say, Coel. There you go. One, submit. And then that will show up on the Wood Fortier site. It'll show up in your lists. Mm -hmm. And eventually it'll get harvested and used for the Atlas of Living Australia as well. Cool. So lots of researchers and stuff use this as well. Great. Yeah. All right. Perfect. That's Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you. Building questions? Oh, yes? Just in terms of the community, are they, like how do, you, how do you pick the bullshit up? <laughs> so oh, say, I saw this, I saw that. Yeah, so that's, that's contentious. <laughs> I don't want to get into trouble. <laughs> but <laughs> reputation, reputation is everything. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like virginity. In general, you can only lose it once, you know? <laughs> so there's a few shady characters around southeast Queensland. And I can... Off air, I can give you some names <laughs> of people to watch out for, but yeah, there, there is a lot of there is a lot of bullshit that goes on, and it's weird too. Like people's egos just get crazy with this stuff. Yeah. I mean, when you get serious about it, some people become super competitive. Like you want to see the most, you want to see the most in a year, or at a site, or whatever, and it gets pretty odd. Mm. Like most competitive things. Mm. Yeah. Can I yeah. just ask about the bell bird because you seem to just hear little pockets of it when you drive yeah. along. So is that, there, what is the bell bird? So it, it's, um, we'll have a look. It's oh, bell minor. Oh, yep. Yeah. And they're a native bird. They build these colonies. Let's have a look. They build these colonies, which is why, you, like you described, yeah. you'll get these little pockets of them. And they used to be. And we had a few on the walk the other day when we went up the hill. So they've got a really tight habitat association with lantana. So they breed in the lantana, they use it for shelter. And so they've kind of become more common in areas where they weren't before because of the lantana. And interestingly, the lantana up on the hill, a lot of it has died because of the drought and the colony has probably retracted back into the national park. Since the rain, it's coming back a bit and we've got a few dribs and drabs, but there's nowhere near as many as there used to be up the hill. Um, so is the lantana not an Australian lantana? Yeah. No, it's a pest. It's a yeah. So they've just taken advantage of it? Yep. Mm, because yeah. there's no ground cover, so they, yeah. you know, as in, because that understory is gone, so mm. the lantana takes over and then that's an understory for small yeah. birds and other things to hide in. And yeah. And they've got a relationship with, they farm a, a thrip or something, is it? Yeah, and lerps, that's what slurps, sorry. Yeah. So yeah, they're, they're also associated with this thing called BMAD, or Bell Minor Associated Dieback. And when they get into these big colonies in the Lantana, one of their preferred food sources is the little sugary excretions of sap drinking insects mm. that live on leaves called lerps. And they produce these little like sugary houses and the birds will come and eat the sugar, but leave the insect. And so they'll kind of, they don't do anything actively, but they're farming these insects and getting them to drink more and more of the plant sap. And it eventually kills the tree because they exclude all the little insectivorous birds from the area, just like noisy miners do as well. They maintain their territory and exclude all the little guys that would actually eat the insect itself and not just the lerp thing. Um, and the trees can't handle it and they just die. Mm -hmm. So like driving up the Toowoomba Range or uh, like up to Cunningham's Gap or up behind Mount Glorious, you can see some areas that have had this... Conondale yeah. forest is where I've heard this the most. Yeah, it'll, it'll probably be happening there too. So big emergent eucalypts, just dead. It's probably from this, yeah. So a native species that's kind of cooperated with a pest species and got out of control there's some efforts to control them and, you know mm. get rid of the lantana and get rid of the bell miners but it's a problem because often the lantana is the only Habitat. shelter for little insectivorous birds so 
and also mammals it's as tricky. well. And there's mammals, like 30 yeah. species of animals using lantana, and Lots if you remove stuff it, uses it. Yeah. there's no habitat left. Yeah. Are they trying to get rid of lantana on wood for you? I'm not sure. No, because what, every time we do, we get erosion. So basically, what we're doing is managing by actually like mosaic. You know, if you want to plant anything, we go into lantana, or if you clear onto lantana, we we'll make sure that there's something emerging underneath that we want to. So we're very careful about what we do with the habitat. Yeah, just because there's echidnas, everything. There's so many animals living in Montana, it's crazy. Like, you just take a walk and you see echidnas scurrying through, so you don't want to remove it. Like, it's a huge area to remove as well. Like, and then every time we remove it, erosion happens, and then nothing grows, you know? Mm. So it's habitat, like... It's a massive job to remove it, too. Yeah. Like, the, the, the roots are really deep. The seed stock is often in the soil, so you'll get rid of it, and then next year it'll yeah. just come up again. And and when there's no flowers, lantana is the only thing that's flowering oftentimes. So all the like thousands of different insects and especially butterflies, that's the only time that they've got food. So they, you know, it's kind of such a tricky situation now. Everything's got to becoming adapted to. It's pretty much naturalized now. Yeah. Like, it's it's just here to yeah. stay. It's not. Yeah. Gonna, we're not going to get rid of it. So. Yeah. Kind of got to learn to live. And birds it. spread the seed. They love the seed, right? Yeah, yeah. The boy so was telling me like silver eyes will eat it. Like some of the fruit right. dogs will eat it. The honey eaters will eat it. Yeah, they'll just oh, nail it. Yeah, and they're yummy too. The, the little berries, so you can eat it. <laughs> Humans can eat it. Yeah, uh -huh. edible. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't eat the flowers because oh, yeah. you might die. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, so Brolga and Sarah's train. People didn't. No, that Sarah's crane existed until like the late seventies, I think, which is bizarre to me because they don't look anything like Brolga. Um, does anyone want a quick look yeah, at the two crews? Yeah. So <laughs> Brolga is the more common species. Most people would have seen these guys. I'm sure they're very pretty, very distinctive, big crane wow. cruises around wetlands. Now have a look at the head and where the extent of red stops and also beneath the chin you can see this thing called a dewlap which is like this little patch of skin that hangs down but you see the red just stops like at the back of the crown of the head like at the back of the skull essentially has anyone ever heard Rolga? Mm -mm. Yeah. it's awesome yeah mm -hmm. dancing I've seen that, yeah. <sighs> So they do this crazy like display dance with each other and jump around. It's really pretty. Well, the Aboriginal communities up there, they have a Brolga dance. Yep. They do. Yeah. yeah. So that's what Brolga looks like. Mm. And then we'll see what Sarah's... Oh, hang on. It had Sarah's there. That's handy. Sarah's crane. Mm. Yeah. I mean, if you saw it from 200 metres away, it wouldn't look crazy different, but if you're close to it, totally different. They don't have a dual lap. The red comes like halfway down the neck. It's just nuts. Mm. But until the 70s, like you can see the distribution of Saris there in purple. People didn't think they occurred in Australia at all. Mm. And they thought they were all just broker. <laughs> I've probably seen them enough. Yeah, people would have just driven past them and not even known. It's just nuts. Yeah. Do they sound the uh, I don't think I've ever heard Brolga, uh, Saris rather, so let's have a listen. Similar. I've heard that up there. Yeah. Where were you? Uh, all through Cape York. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, there we go. Cool. All right, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your bush time experience. Mm -hmm.